This is The Art of Startup War, and I am your sensei, Brian McMahon. Now, in season one and two, I got inside the minds of startup investors. In season three, I brought in entrepreneurs to share their startup journey. Here, in season four, we combine both so you can hear investors critique the investment value proposition of individual companies. You're going to hear how investors make decisions to invest in startups, what makes a great entrepreneur, and how billion dollar companies are built. So tune in every Tuesday, 10 a.m., on all the major platforms. You can empower your tribe by sharing the podcast. And remember to subscribe, rate, review, and leave us a comment. It's Brian. It's 10 o'clock. It's Tuesday morning. I'm back. Uh, and I want to talk to you about an incredible journey of two entrepreneurs who started a company called Guestwiser. I met them actually at one of our investor festivals many, many moons ago. And I remember afterwards, one of the investors, because for those of you who don't know our investor festivals, we bring in 20, 30, 40 investors. They meet with startups. You know, a lot of the time it's about getting to know each other and going to like the next step maybe. And But I always remember the investor at this one particular investor festival come back to me and say, I want to meet you next week because these guys are absolutely awesome. And it was like first time we met. And I thought, shit, I wish every encounter with everyone could be like this. So Luke and David, welcome. And um, back in the days, that was Guestwiser, right? Today, yeah. um, as you've just expanded, and I think this is what happens with companies, either we, we started and we, we stumbled along, or we started and it flies. And you guys flew, and you flew so fast that your branding and everything evolved with it. And now the company is Journey, which is J-U-R-N-Y. Um, talk to us a little bit about, Luca, maybe you can kick this off, um, a little bit about just those early days when you when you first met with John here and you got that investment and it came through and like how how maybe the challenges at the beginning and then we'll kind of move to the euphoria afterwards of building a business with the complexity that you're building. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, f- I think one of the first things that I can talk about is the how nervous we were the first time we came here. <laughs> and I remember the first Invest Festival and David and I like didn't really have a clear idea, you know, how the, the entire invest, investment war so we, d- we didn't even have a clear idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we remember coming here and, like, you know, like, thinking we got everything figured out, but we were still very nervous. And then, like, you know, like, p- pitching all these investors and, and like, you know, realizing that we were actually pretty far off to where we needed to be. Um, and that was the first time we came here. And I remember coming the second time. Um, like I think a couple months later, after we started a conversation with different investors, like we're a completely different feeling and different, different yeah. completely different mood, uh, and and not be nervous at all, and like actually be very confident of the product that we had and 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 then what we created. Because uh, it's a different world, right? Actually, building a great business and building great investor relations are in two entirely different things. Completely. Because you don't know these guys at all. You don't exactly. know what they're thinking, what they're looking for. They just look at you blankly like you're an idiot. Exactly. Um, but it's because you you, you you weren't focused on that. You were focused on building a great business. C- correct. And, uh, and I can add something, actually, that, that um, the ne- quote-unquote negative feedback of investor helps startups a lot to figure out what they're doing wrong that yeah. they are not even foreseeing, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I remember from the first time we came, there was like many things that we thought that we were doing right that we we're actually not doing right. And we fixed them. And then when we came back, we we're like, okay, well, now we got it fixed. Uh, so so starting earlier on, earlier even than, than when you're ready, it's, it's actually very helpful. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm with you that. on that. What kind of things did you learn, David? Like well, we're ready to start with the investor feedback. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I was going to say, I want to just cut back a second even before that when Luca and I partnered up. We uh, had partnered up and we built a business with just our skin and our own money first to a few million dollars in revenue. And we got profitable because we had to make a living off the business. So we had to make the choice to get profitable, make sure we can pay our own family's bills. And then we said, you know, but we're very ambitious individuals. And we said, we want to make something huge. And when the time is right, we're going to raise funding to do that and scale the business. So when we came in, we were nervous. But we were also confident because we were like, we built something already. We're already profitable and we're going to use that. And the investors are going to respect that. But it's true. It's such a different game building a business and pitching an investor and clearly articulating what it is you built and where you want to go. And it's the negative feedback that was everything, as Lucas said, because when we now when we come back and now when we pitch investors for future rounds and 
pitch even clients. I take it to selling clients our product. It's a whole different world. Once you get that understanding of how to pitch and articulate a product, there's no going back. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a great not, skill set. And also, it's not a logical progression because you come into it thinking, like what you did, you said it very quickly there, but it's very poignant what you said. We built a business doing revenue of millions of dollars. That's it. Like, that's the holy grail. The holy grail is supposed to be we build these phenomenal businesses which makes money. But if you go to an investor and say, I got this awesome thing we're doing. We have a business where we're bringing in revenue of millions of dollars. And you know what? We're making profits. They're going to say, that sucks. Like, why <laughs> would you, what would possess you to want to make profits? And you're like, what? <laughs> like, it's not what you do if you want a venture back business. Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> why? Because the thing is, it's not that it's logical. It's not logical. It doesn't make sense. And actually, if we look at many of the venture backed businesses today, like, it's a travesty in American startup that we actually have allowed. I'm watching SoftBank unravel over the last two or three weeks. And you think, how the hell does a pizza delivery business get $400 million? Like, who thought that was a good idea for them just to hire that amount of people? But it wasn't about ever making money. But what was beautiful from your perspective, and I think what attracted the investors so quickly here, was that your focus was on not on the first day, oh, I want to raise money, 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 money. Your focus was on, I want to build a great business. And when I build a great business, then I want to go into folks and I want to give them the opportunity to help us scale higher. And then we're going to find out how do we scale in a different way? Because it's at that moment you make the decision, we are not going to be a family service business that might do 15, 20, 30 million dollars in revenue. We are going to be a venture backed business that can do 300 plus million dollars in revenue. Correct. But it's fascinating, right? Yeah, correct. That, that was actually our motivation, right? Like, so, to, so to that point, actually, the way we quickly realized that um, when we started raising money, we thought, like, yeah, we have a valuable business. We're making money. Like, we're, we're going to be able to raise money, right? We just want to scale now, now our business. Like, actually, when we started raising money, we quickly realized that most businesses actually were not making money. Yeah. Us having revenue and it wasn't ne- or, or profits it wasn't necessarily like a benefit. Yeah. Right. But it's all about driving more revenue and more revenue. Correct. So you can build the business up. Yes. But but we came but thankfully we actually had investors that recognized that value in us. Um like awesome investors. Yeah, because it's so hard. Like, I mean, to be able to build a business up on your own with just your own skin in the game to a couple of million bucks a year, that's a big, big deal. Let's talk a little bit about the business. Maybe, David, like talk to us a little bit about the business and tell us the genesis of the idea and then how you built it and how, because I'm sure every startup and investor listening to this is thinking, how do they manage to get a business up to a couple of million dollars without any real venture investment? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, it's interesting because I was in a previous business. My background is in business development, and we had it was a family business that I was a part of, but we had done some pretty impressive things. But it wasn't my company. And I'm in, like as I said, I'm an ambitious individual. I wanted to build my own business. And I was looking in the market and I was thinking what I want to do because I was going to leave the my family's business, take the money that I had earned, and start something new. I was looking to get into day trading, and I was also I had my eye on the short-term rental market. You know, it was, this is about three years ago. There was a lot of movement starting to take place. I believe in my ability to build something. And I thought there's a lot of money there to make. I met Luca through a mutual friend um, who I had met through my wife. So my wife is the start of all of this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I met Luca through a dear friend who's a dear friend of mine and also a dear friend of his. And I had heard of Luca for a bunch of years. Like we were around in similar circles, but we never met. And um, my friend is like, you got to meet Luca because you want to day trade and he's great at trading. You guys should talk. And I'm like, perfect. I'm looking for somebody to do this with. So we go for a uh, coffee at a place called Tiago, which is right across from WeWork, which yeah, is yeah. where we started. Yeah. Um, Crazy. And we had coffee one morning and he's like, we're talking about trading and about our ambitions and our vision for life and uh, our philosophy about spirituality and business and everything. We really got into a lot of things and there was so much synergy. And I had told him about the short-term rental space. And he's like, you got to hear what I really do for a living. He was already in the space. He was already doing um, 
home management, um, making profit off this newly emerging industry, looking at it in a very unique way. And I'm like, that's exactly the type of mind that, that I would want to be. And a that's part like of. holiday rental home management, is it? Short term travelers, right? Someone gotcha. who would stay in a Marriott, but looking to stay in an alternative type Beautiful. of Beautiful. So that when Airbnb revolutionized this entire industry, this would have been about five years into it. Yeah. I got you. Okay. So he was already doing that. And then you said, I want to join you. But what value did you bring to the partnership at that stage? So it's interesting. First, I'm like, dude, if you can really tell me what you can make on a property before we invest into a property, I'm just going to go bring you money. I know everybody. I can sell. Let's just go Let's just go buy properties or lease properties and make money. And that's how it was going to start. But we had so much synergy. And Luke was like, David, like, we got to talk more because we, if we're going to do this, let's do this right. Let's go into business together. Don't you just go make commission, go try to make money. Let's do this together. And I'm like, that was speaking to me because that's what I wanted to do, start my own company. And so we, and, and it, it, he was about to pivot as well. So it was a perfect time to kind of make some pivot, bring in my expertise and do it together. And so we, and actually that's when we adopted the name Guestwiser from a previous name. And so we did that um, in January 1st, we started of 2017. And we basically hit the ground running. I'm happy to talk about the amazing, details of that. But amazing, amazing. Like we're only talking three years ago. Yeah. And so you built it. You built the revenue up to a couple of million dollars in in how long? It's even better. Luca had a million bucks a year coming in already. Wow. We let go of all that business, started from scratch, from zero, and in one year, built our runway to two point three million dollars. Oh, come on! From man. zero, though, we let go of all the old business to start all the new business, and that's what we were able to build together in one year. Wow! But so the idea was what. You you take care of them. You do entire management. You provide an entire concierge to everybody. So w the idea originally was we had a vision. And it's funny you talked about SoftBank and WeWork. We said, okay, there's something here. But what's long-term and what's scalable? Yeah. And Luke has been through a lot. He also dealt with homeowners and management. And he dealt with different facets of the business. He was Man, I, just, I had yeah. all the wrong friends in life. Like my buddy <laughs> and me, we used to sell soda on the friggin' beach. Why didn't I know any Lucas? This sucks. <laughs> Go on. That's very funny. So, <laughs> friggin' um... true. My life is like a <laughs> Roman tragedy. Let me tell you. Go on. So, um, yeah. So, no. So, we were obsessing about scalability. Yeah. And so, you know, WeWork was booming and growing like crazy, mm -hmm. and they're signing leases. We wanted to build technology, innovation, things that would allow us to be almost automated, if you will, around onboarding of apartments, getting them live, operating them, but in a scalable kind of automated way. Amazing. And we didn't know exactly what we wanted, but we knew where we wanted to go. Amazing. So we started by leasing apartments, like everybody else, mm -hmm. so that we would have the inventory to build our processes and technology around. Which is brave in itself. It was brave. You we put our own, money, our own money into it. You walked it was... away from like having a million bucks coming in to actually having negative. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right, actually. Wow. We put our own money and raised some debt and we did it. Uh, and that's what we built. So we ra we leased 44 apartments. Amazing. We leased them in different cities. So we're op we operate out of Los Angeles. One of the things that we wanted to prove is that data can tell us where we should invest without even having to visit there. And we successfully huh. leased 44 apartments across Dallas and Nashville from Los Angeles, got them up and running and furnished. And if you look at our listings, they're unbelievably designed all from Los Angeles in digital floor plans and operate them for a massive profit. Because people just rent them out from Warren short-term rentals. You're geniuses. Yeah, there's a, there is a, but we figure out a science, right? Like we figure out a science behind on how to make money. Oh no, this isn't easy. This. I say yeah, you're yeah, geniuses, yeah. like I know this, my partner LP, one of the biggest real estate guys in LA, trust me, I know family apartments and doing them, it's a graveyard for most people. So to be able to create the science and to do it outside your city to start with is huge. Yeah, like David mentioned, like we, we, we started leasing 44 apartments and what we wanted to do, he said we went from year one to go from zero to $2.3 million in uh, yearly revenues. And that was in the first year. After the second year, we decided not to grow. Because what we wanted to do, we wanted to perfection the science behind what we were doing. Because our goal was to operate those 44 units with zero employees on the ground. Wow. And we achieved that, right? Because you outsourced all of the management. 
So we well, we we automated it on the entire management. Amazing. Like we have we develop software, we use we use technology and hardware specifically to do that. We have um, electric locks, for example, for to to that they will update codes automatically every time a guest comes in and comes out to track who's cleaning the units. Each cleaner has its own code, so we know which cleaner clean what. Uh, so we're able to basically track everything at distance. Beautiful. But we had to perfection that. Beautiful. So, so we wanted to perfection that, create a science around it, and then create a scalable model, right? Um, which we did. And before going and raising money, that's that's the reason why we went and raised money. We wanted to now, now that we created a scalable model, we wanted to go and raise money. And so that's what we did after two years of operating the business. Amazing. And then so you took it to that level, you've raised the first amount of money, What's the plan going forward? Because, you know, normally I spend half an hour in this podcast talking about the travesties and how difficult it was and how terrible it was. But you just had a brilliant idea, which you executed phenomenally well. You built automation and structure into it right at the beginning. You bypassed all of that bullshit that I normally need to talk about, about how hard it was. This was about building and scaling. Yeah, well, let me tell you, I think one of the reasons is because both David and I were not our first businesses. Like, we come from different backgrounds, but we've built companies before. And we hear that a lot in the podcast, by the way. Folks who are doing first businesses, it's just you've no idea of the hell that's coming at you. Correct. We, we knew, we know that building a business is hell, and that's, but that's what we live for, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, of course it comes with... It's a predictable hell, right? It, it's because, a predictable exactly. hell, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, but it wasn't obviously paying less, right? Like there's there's nothing there's nothing business that is easy, right? Like, yeah. So so we we went through struggle, but we knew what we were doing. We had a very co- like clear goal, and we still do. And you know, I think knowing where you want to go and knowing what you're doing it makes a big difference. So talk to me about the goal, David. Yeah, so so uh, and by the way, I'll just put this into context. I met a fella called David Johnson over at Virgin Gorda, which is one of the British Virgin Islands. And he was a property developer over in the Midwest. And he said his goal at the beginning, right, when he started off property development, was to develop 10% of all properties in the United States. Like, that was his goal. And it was so audacious and so huge. But I feel with you both that whatever you're going to say to me is going to be equally insanely ambitious, Absolutely. And so two things. One is Luca touched upon it when we got negative investor feedback that helped us a lot because we knew we wanted like the utmost scalability and it helped us kind of mold our final model, which is never final because as you know, in business, you need to be innovating every day and thinking 10 steps ahead or you're never going to grow to the level you want. That's just an absolute rule of thumb. So, but it got to a level where we can now offer it and sell it, which is we got it. We don't lease anymore. That was just to get inventory to build our product. Yeah. We now offer a management model, but we know who to offer it to and how to offer it and what it needs to be inclusive of to be able to bring a lot of added value to real estate owners. So when we're competing in the space of short-term rental, we're not actually competing with our competition because they offer nothing like what we're offering. You offer them a service. We're offering a service that's going to make you more money and align our interests with you, the owner. We can be your hotel brand and make you money. Because, by the way, every single every single rental property on the planet wants to be what you do. Yes. Nobody wants the hassle of having to manage and going in and deal with stuff in an analog way. But people don't have the expertise to be able to do it themselves. For the sake of a small amount of money per month, they're real happy to outsource that. Absolutely. And then talk to me about that trajectory and when that happened and then how that moves forward in the future. Absolutely. So we closed our round back in April Mm -hmm. after having gotten to the model where we all agreed with our investors. As Luca said, we had amazing investors who really helped us. Like our lead, he helped who we met here, by the way, at Expert Dojo. Yeah, great guy. Great guy. And he helped us. Real genuine guy. Mm -hmm. And I haven't met a million VCs yet, but from what I hear, he stands out as one of the genuine guys. John is one of the most special guys you'll you'll meet because he cares. Yeah. And I'm not saying other VCs don't care. I'm just saying a lot of people will take a more investment banking attitude. He's not only brilliantly smart and very analytical, but he's just a genuine good human being who cares about his startup. So you, you got... You got lucky. I mean, I'm really glad we had him here, but you you chose well and you got lucky. Absolutely. And so he helped. He really worked with us as our lead to kind of fine tune all of our 
our decks, the model, exactly what we're taking to the market so that it will be investable and it will be scalable. We did that. We cl- we got way oversubscribed on our first round. So we were able, again, lucky to choose just the best investors we wanted to be part of the team who we thought can bring intangible value along with the capital because the capital was triple what we were asking for. Incredible. But we wanted the right people. Um, me and Luca, it's interesting. We're very, very ambitious alpha male individuals. No way. But we're also humble. <laughs> yeah. But we also try to live with humility. And so that's also how we work well together. Yeah, you're good guys. Um, and so... You and we think that's key because you have to you need help of people no matter who how good you think you are. And me and Luca both realize that and we both live by that. So we were able to understand we need the right investors. It's gonna be key. It's not just us. We can't go just take money and run with it. We need support and help of the right people. And so they came in, that happened, and now going forward, we have a model. So we've tripled the size of the business since the investment came in. Amazing. But what's really amazing is that wasn't what we were focused on yet. Um, we were actually building out certain technologies and things to give us a big runway versus anybody else in the space. Um, and only in the last few months have we really ramped up the outreach. And we're about to triple the new size of the business again in just probably the next six weeks or so. Incredible. With how many extra staff? Team of 12 right now in the internal office. Yeah. Uh, we have one person overseas. And then we have a customer service um, team of five people who are also overseas. Which is still tiny. Yeah. Tiny for what for the kind of revenue that you're bringing in right now. And then you're going to come up. Go on. Sorry. Luke. Yeah. We're operating 130 units uh, with just the people that he just mentioned. And all hotels operate each room for, like, for example, Marriott or Hyatt. They operate each room with 2.2 people Incredible. per room. And then so talk to me about that ambitious lofty goal. Where we're going. Where are you going? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'll speak, and Luca, please add it, but we're, we want to be um, the premier hotel brand in the world. We believe that what we're doing is oh, the so future. It's, sm- it's a small goal then. Yeah, I mean, you know, whatever, right? But we believe what we're building really is the future of travel. Um, that's the business model we talked about, but the final goal is to be a consumer brand where people can have instant access to their short-term rental apartment wherever and whenever with the click of an app. And that technology is already built into all of our apartments. So we already have that workable. We just need inventory. Our goal is to have millions of units one day that are journey-branded hotel units around the world. And you'll get those inventory from everybody who's got a apartment that they're doing short-term rentals on or that they want to. So, uh, yeah, no, let me me speak a little bit about that. Uh, Our – we're actually selective on what we take. We only work with multifamily complexes in, like – great they have to be in desirable locations and in great buildings like we don't so we are we're pretty selective but even that amount of inventory is almost unlimited (laughs) if you look at the worldwide inventory right we're talking about millions of units right so uh but our goal was to align our interest with the ones of the owners and to to create a product where that doesn't create any extra work to the owner and at the same time increases their profits right wanted to create a product that is almost too good to be true, which yeah, is, which yeah, almost yeah. is too good to be true when, when we pitch it, right? Yeah. Um, but every single person that has worked with us has at, made more money. Had made more money, and guess what? Has invested more. Yeah. There, right? You know, there's so many. We're like we're raising money for work for work, to have work capital, but we don't have to raise money to acquire inventory, right? Because people will invest for us. Because the the interests are online, you're Once really raising money to scale fast. Correct. That's the, that's the only but reason. if somebody owns a, a, a small multifamily complex with ten units, and now he sees that he's making three times than he was making before, that person is going to say, "I'm not going to give you ten units. I'm going to give you a hundred units next time." So, people grow with us. Our goal was to align the interests again with the owners to build businesses with them. Right? Um, we always said, if we do it for ourselves, we'll become rich. But that's not what we want to do. We wanted to really create a solution for this market. So by aligning our interests, like really, we will have entrepreneurs, developers, and real estate people around the world all working in conjunction with us to build the new the new way of traveling. Plus, you've done you've done a few things. There's a few things you're doing which are really exciting. Number one, you're changing the Silicon Valley model. The Silicon Valley model was Little value, lots of users, zero loyalty, 
less profit, actually loss, right? That was the model. Right? You're changing that to massive value, huge win-win for all parties involved, massive referral, higher loyalty, and higher profits. And by the way, the ones who wins the most are the folks who are your clients who get higher profits again. So it's a step up on every single level. So that is huge. And, and actually to a stage that I have been for the past couple of years, but especially last year, really worried about America. Like I'm really, really worried about the state of entrepreneurship in America. I'm worried about the folks that we invest in. I'm worried about some of the companies that are broken through. And I'm worried about what it's doing to us as the top entrepreneurship nation on the planet. And I think people are eating our lunch because of it. So for me, it's, it's super exciting when I see you come through because it's not just the fact that like we met the first time in the dojo and I love the fact that you got John here and I love the fact that you've built the business and I love the fact that we keep interacting and working together as I see you guys grow and get bigger. But I think you can make a really strong statement in California and in America, which is, you know what? Screw this whole we can beat our competitors by having unfairly subsidized venture prices. We can beat our competitors by, you know, forcing them out of business, not because we're better, but because we just happen to have more money than them. Like you're coming in and providing great services that help everyone. And that has to be the new model because it has to, because we have to get back to a place where we start leading an entrepreneurship again. So I, I see my goal with you is even bigger of just you can make all of the friggin' stuff that's happened over the last couple of years go away and turn into a whole way better future. So it's awesome. What I also love is the fact that for entrepreneurs listening, everything you're talking about is obsessive aggression on growth, revenue, and profits. And that's what people should be learning. We, we, we should absolutely iterate. We should absolutely make sure our product is good. We should absolutely make sure that folks are happy with it. But we should drive the revenue in the bottom line and make sure that we get great businesses. So as role leaders, you're doing an amazing job here. And then finally, I just want to move to the raise that you're going to go to next. So now you're moving up a big level, right? What type of investors are we looking for? How much are you, type, are you looking to raise if you want to share that? And but just give us a little bit of a feel for investors that are listening into this podcast, how they can get engaged with you from now going forward. So we, we raised our seed round mm -hmm. about eight months ago right now. Uh, we raised $1.75 million. Yeah. And we raised a $2 million uh, credit, uh, venture debt mm -hmm. uh, of credit line plus another $700,000 of working capital in that. Yep. So that was like our initial raise. Yep. And now we're looking for a couple months away for start, from start actively looking. And we're looking at $20 million. Yep. Series and A. Series A Pretty for good. $20 million. And we have already ventured that dedicated that they're going to be matching just as much as we're going to be raising Series A. Yeah, so you're going for it. This is it. That, and I love that. This is 2020, man. It's a new decade. We're looking to, like, there's no there's no tiptoeing into this and seeing what's going to happen. you got to go properly. And then with that 20 million that you raise, where do you expect the revenue to go to and what do you expect to happen with the business, possibly over the following 12 months? Well, so what's interesting, again, is as we were profitable before, and we can actually turn profitable at any time. We yeah. keep the company in that stage at all times yeah. with the amount of units, the amount of revenue, and how much we push it and how much we push our burn. Um, with the, tw the, the point of raising that much capital is because we want to be able to get real market dominance right away at that stage. Um, and that capital will allow us to do that. It's to build out our infrastructure, our technology stack, the internal company itself, to be able to handle the management of tens of thousands of apartments around the world. As we've proven, we can manage around the world. We can manage in different cities from LA, but we just, you got to do it right. So we, and we need to have the infrastructure to handle that many units. Um, this raise will allow us to do that. Another thing that's interesting is the debt piece. The reason why we also want to raise a debt piece is we offer incentives and we help remove the barrier for owners to be able to partake of this industry. Uh, there are costs associated with getting hotels up and running and things like that. And this debt piece, the point of it is to help uh, support owners in getting them up and running. And we always just make our profit back later. Um, so that's that's the goal of this round. And yeah. we, we have something right now that nobody in this space has in terms of our offering to the market and our capability to run the way we do. 
Um, so we can raise a smaller A and then go for a bigger B, et cetera. But we, we don't want to be caught. And right now we're not being caught. So we need to raise as much as possible and get as big as possible, as fast as possible right at this time. You know, it's really funny. You remind me of a younger Regis when Regis first set out. Not a WeWork, but I don't know if you know the story of Regis, but he grew from having two or three business centers to having, I think, 8,000 business centers. And like, if you look at them conversely to WeWork, WeWork, I don't know, two, 300 locations. Regis have seven, 8,000 locations. They build it up. They got 30% profit margins on their space. They built unique units back in the day. And they have perfect floor sizes that they know where they can make money from it. They haven't not returned shareholders' dividends in 10 years. And they haven't not made money in 10 years. So I see you going through this massive scale over the next three to four years and then putting yourself into a position whereby you have your management team in place, you have your service team in place, you have tens of thousands of apartments in place, and you're just getting ching, 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 ching for every single day that goes by. Yeah, our profit margins are pretty impressive. Yeah, I can see that. That's brilliant. So for all you investors out there, you heard it here. This is the company to go after. Um, Can you just share, I'd like you to share, if you can, an email address, either for Luca or David, whoever you prefer, and then website, so they have it. And then one, a lot of the time I ask, in, in folks that I'm with in the in, in the fridge because this is the warmest fridge mm-hmm. on the planet, right? Especially in the afternoon. So when we're in the fridge, I'll normally say, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs? But I'm not going to ask you that because you're growing like a friggin' rocket ship. I want to ask you, after you give your email and your website, I want a statement to investors of what you're going to do for them when they invest in you. Sounds great. Well, I'll give you my email. It's david at journey.com. It's fairly simple, D-A-V-I-D at journey.com. Journey's J-U-R-N-Y. And that's our website, journey.com, J-U-R-N-Y.com. Perfect. Now, statement to investors. What are you telling them? They're coming in for 20 million. What are they, what's going to happen? I'll start. Every once in a while, you know, a special company comes along where there's an opportunity for massive exits, an opportunity to truly disrupt a space. You know, we actually watch the WeWork situation very closely have a lot of intel into the situation. And they and the investors, SoftBank in particular, believed that was one of those special companies that was coming about. That's why they funneled them with so much cash to grow. We knew that there were inherent flaws in the model. We believe we fixed those flaws in our space. And our space is ripe for disruption in a long-term changing way, not just to grow and have an exit, but to create long-term value that in 30 years from now, what we believe what we're working on is what people are going to be expecting all over the world in 30 years from now. This is the future. So if you get in with us now, you can be part of what's going to be written in the history books one day. That's what we believe. Boom, baby. I love it. That's a wrap. I got nothing to add to that. Thanks for joining us. If you love the podcast, please empower your circle by sharing these stories. The Art of Startup War is brought to you by Expert Dojo. And remember, we invest in startups, $50,000 checks. Make sure you apply on our site if you are one of those great entrepreneurs looking to bring your company to the next level. As far as the Art of Startup War is concerned, we are back every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. So remember... Check out the new episodes. If you want to find out what the investors think, check out season one or two. But make sure you join us every single week.